So what I'd like to do is think, think about uh, like translation um, and, but kind of starting with mice models and then uh, kind of thinking about humans as well. So in mice, so in mice models, we see a number of significant benefits from supplementation with NAD precursors, generally NR, I think. Well, actually, yeah, that, NR. There's a pretty growing NMN literature as well now. <laughs> okay. And so could you summarize, I mean, I think we've seen a lot, but, but could you summarize some of the key benefits that we've seen in mice? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there are a lot. I mean, you can spend a lot of time going through the individual studies. Um, but I think, you know, the most encouraging things that have really captured people's attention are that there's an anti-diabetic effect where so it mm. improves glucose tolerance, uh, improves insulin sensitivity in a lot of mouse models um, at high doses. And some of them, it actually causes weight loss as well. Um, there is a, a clear effect on heart failure now across nine or 10 models uh, where either NMN or NR are given in, in mice where they have either genetically induced heart failure or experimentally induced heart failure. Um, you improve the heart function quite a bit. Typically about 50% of the, of the defect is repaired in a lot of those models. Um, and there's now, again, eight or nine papers on, um, on cognitive function in Alzheimer's disease models in mice where there's a pretty consistent improvement in their ability to to perform in cognitive tasks. So I, th I think those those are the major, uh, the, the major findings that have driven, I think, human clinical trials to, to, to try to replicate some of the effects. Um, there's many other things for it. So we, we look at uh, liver regeneration and acute kidney injury quite a bit in my lab, which is very uh, robustly improved with these NAD precursors as well. And there's a lot of different scenarios like that that people have studied. <laughs> so why doesn't this translate into humans, because there's been a lot of, not a lot, there's been a number of human trials with NR and NMN, but not many really positive results. Right. I mean, that's that's the that's the huge question in the field right mm. now. I mean, I th the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, is just the dose, right? So we, mm. we're using huge doses of mice, 500 milligrams per kilogram. So humans would be eating 40 or 50 grams if we were taking the same dose. And, you know, people make these arguments about allometric scaling, typically mice metabolize drugs faster. So for a, a, a more common drug that works, you know, by inhibiting an enzyme or something and then is excreted through drug metabolism pathways, it might make sense that humans would take a much lower dose than the mice because they would turn it over and get rid of it really quick. But mice cells and human cells have about the same NAD concentration and turnover rate. <laughs> And so if, you're, if your goal is to boost the NAD concentration in a given volume of tissue, you really might have to scale by body weight, which means for some of these indications, it may just you know, be that, that until we take doses that are way beyond what people are willing to take and, and potentially safe, <laughs> uh, we may not see exactly what's happening in the mice and humans. And, and I think you said before that like three grams, is it like three grams of nicotinamide is... Uh is poisonous to the liver or something toxic to the liver. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so um, it, I mean, not hundred percent of people, but, but you, you need to be under a doctor's supervision. If you're you typically over a gram a day of, of uh, niacin or, or, or nicotinamide um, and three is the threshold where a lot of people start to get hepatotoxicity and have to come off of them. Um, and so that's, that's the threshold people have had in mind when treating with nicotinamide riboside or mononucleotide, trying to stay away mm -hmm. from that three gram mark, I think to, you know, avoid the possibility of, of, of having these types of side effects. Um, I mean, any idea why mice are okay with like 10 times as much? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it's, we, we don't exactly know where that hepatotoxicity is coming from in humans either. So it's a little bit hard to sort of put your finger on exactly what's going wrong there in the mice, or I mean, wrong in the humans that, that the mice are able to tolerate a little better. Uh, I mean, I think in general, they are just better at at conjugating things to molecules and getting them out in the urine than, than humans. But uh, but no, I don't, I don't have a specific explanation for that. And, I, and like I said, I'd love to know exactly even what the molecular mechanism of the problem is in humans, which we don't know. What positive results have we seen in humans so far? Right. So, so yeah, the, I think the, the standard procedure for these human studies so far has been to pick one of these most benefits, particularly some of the metabolic benefits, um, and take that as the primary endpoint and measure a bunch of other stuff because you've got the study going. And, and I think the, the standard outcome has been that missing the primary endpoint and finding something else that looks interesting. <laughs> um, and, mm. and so 
So in a couple of studies, that's been body composition. So they haven't seen weight loss generally in humans, but there has been an, a shift towards more lean mass, um, which mm. is sort of a healthier body composition and you know, a hint that maybe you could build muscle mass you know, with mm. longer term studies. Um, there has, so first of all, there, there's been a good safety profile. It's been the main outcome people keep highlighting. Mm. <laughs> and there's consistently yeah. a boost in, in uh, NAD levels in the blood, in whole blood, so in the, mainly in the red blood cells in the circulation. Um, so it's hitting the target in that sense. Um, we get the body composition improvements. There's been one study that suggested an improvement in muscle insulin sensitivity uh, mm -hmm. with NMN and a, a couple suggesting no improvement in insulin sensitivity with NR. So I think that the jury's still out on, you know, whether whether there's something different about the methodological design that's going to, you know, maybe make sense of that or if, or if one or the other is going to prove to be the answer. Um, and I think the, the biggest success story so far has been in, in mitochondrial myopathy. So it's been the one case where there it's a rare disease, um, but it's been shown that patients actually have lower NAD levels in their blood and in muscle tissue. And in that case, supplementing them had functional improvements. So, so uh, that was done with niacin, which is nicotinic acid, mm -hmm. so one of the earlier forms that people have used. And it's um, that one has some effects on lipid lowering that are independent of NAD levels. And it has a, a cheap protein coupled receptor it hits called GPR109A that is unrelated to synthesizing NAD. So it's, it's possible there's some off-target effects not related to NAD in that study that could contribute mm -hmm. to the benefits. But that is a case where the you know it's probably going to become standard of care for that disease. Um, there is a functional benefit in like the six minute walk tests and standing from a chair. Like people are seeing real functional improvements with the with the NAD boosting there. And the reason to hope that at least um, part of the function is coming from NAD itself uh, is that the the preliminary studies, the preclinical work that supported that study, was done in mice with nicotinamide riboside, <laughs> and, and they still saw benefits in the mouse models. So so I think. Probably that's NAD related, but we have to be a little cautious because it is nicotinic acid that was used. Right, which is another precursor. It just uses a different path. Yes, it, but it's, it uses a different path, but then it has this possibility of, of binding you know, a, a, this G protein coupled receptor right. that is unrelated yeah. to NAD. So it's, that precursor is a bit unique in its actions. That it, has, it has some additional effects beyond NAD boosting. If you were thinking about running a human trial, or you, you were going to advise someone who's going to run a human trial with NR or NMN, what would you, what would you suggest as the best way to make it effective? Mm -hmm. I mean, like use three grams or, um, <laughs> or is there or, or like any other way of making it more effective? I'm really not sure there is this. I mean, I'm getting asked right. this in real life, you know, right. quite often as we're going forward. And, you know, I mean, there's, like I said, I, I am concerned that the dose reasoning is too low, but I, you know, I think there's a real need also that all the safety assessments have to be done again if we ratchet up the dose. Um, I think the main thing people can do right now um, is do their best to measure tissue levels of NAD. I mean, that's, that's the biggest question. We know that in the blood, NAD levels go up, but... We really need to know if there's target engagement in the tissue of interest, right? Like, and so far, the only place people have tried very hard to look is in muscle, mm -hmm. and and there hasn't actually been an increase in NAD with most of the supplementation strategies in muscle. So I think that's something we really have to get a handle on: is you know, are we getting the NAD increased where we meant to <laughs> for the outcome we're then trying to measure? So are you are you aware of um, the work of of uh, Dr. Zemel who is using? Leucine with NMN? Yes. Yeah, I, so I just wonder what your thoughts were on that, because leucine seemed to increase the effect of NMN, at least on CERT1, was it, I think? Yeah, I mean, so that's, well, so, so, I mean, there's two, there's the proposed mechanism there, and then there's you know, the, the observed outcomes. Mm -hmm. So so I think Dr. Summers doing, you know, amazing work and, and kind of heroic work in terms of actually combining some of these interventions, which is, there's such a mind blowing number of com combinations that are possible that I think a lot of people have thrown their hands up and we've really hesitated too to, to start to get into these combinatorial questions. Um, and he certainly is seeing interesting outcomes with many of the combinations he's chosen. So I, th I think this is, this is something we have to follow up on. Um, in a lot of cases, the mechanism that he's proposing through CERT1 isn't directly tested in a lot of the studies, right? So I, I my best guess, honestly, for leucine synergizing would be that that 
Um, leucine can promote TOR signaling, which would boost the pentose phosphate pathway, which generates one of the intermediates you need to synthesize NAD. Um, so I at least at least I'd put forward one additional hypothesis for why that is working. But I think the the overall result that it is uh, making the NAD, NAD boosters more effective is 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 really important to follow up on. So you did talk about cognitive decline, well, at least Alzheimer's in mice. Um, did, did, have we seen anything, uh, also sarcopenia I was thinking about. So have we seen anything in humans in either of those? Um, we haven't, other than no, you know, right. you, 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 this Janssen study, right, where they, the less functional people certainly you know, have more tendency towards right. sarcopenia. Um, oh, no. yeah. In mice, there have been a couple of, you know, in, uh, people have looked at disuse atrophy and shown that you can maintain muscle mass better, uh, and cancer cachexia and shown you can maintain muscle mass better. And so the, you know, the, the idea is out there that maybe it's good for sarcopenia, but I'm not aware of that having been directly tested yet. <laughs> right. Because you would think people who are a lot more active would have less, less sarcopenia anyway, right. because, because they are more active. Yeah, yeah, so you don't need an interventional study to kind of <laughs> to <laughs> this, but an observation.